From the Greenhouse, it's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 76, and uh, I was practicing the mushroom ragu recipe from the YouTube channel a little while back, and my wife walked into the room with her phone, and she asked me a question, and here's what unfolded. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? Oh, at least once a day. Really? Yeah. Why? That's just what we do. Who's we? Gentlemen of a certain age. <laughs> what do you think about the Roman Empire? Oh, uh, they're a bunch of assholes. Okay. But like, what causes it to come into your mind? I, you hit a certain age as a, as a, as a male identifying person. And for some reason, you just become interested in military history. It's like this wind that just breezes into your brain from somewhere far away. A gentleman f- smells the first whiff of the autumn of his life approaching. <laughs> he then just wants to stack his bookshelf full of big fat tomes about like war, Mussolini and stuff. Yeah. Um, hey, Lauren's here. Welcome, Lauren, my Hi. wife, my lovely wife. This is weird. You're so <laughs> you're away. So ob- yes, we're, uh, we, we're we heard you about the cicadas and that they are unpleasant when you have headphones in. Sure, yes. So we are we are talking into two microphones this time so that we can be closer to the microphones, thereby maximizing our signal-to-noise ratios. Um, the problem with using two microphones is then we must be far away from each other <laughs> because when you have two mics close to each other, you get phase interference. Yeah, reach, re- it's like, reach out, reach out. Reach out. Oh. Yeah. oh. oh. <laughs> Anywho, um, so we're going to talk about the internet topic du jour, which is why dudes like me, which is kind of most dudes basically uh, are obsessed with the Roman empire and in ways that could maybe be alarming. And uh, mm-hmm. we're going to kind of interrogate that a little bit. Um, but first we need to like stipulate that women are into Roman empire too. Well, sure. Non-binary people are into Roman empire too. I found uh, a survey from the like American society of classics professors or something from 2012 that found that it was a 60, 40 male to female ratio among classics faculty in the United mm-hmm. States in 2012. It's probably close closer to equal these days, I would imagine. Like, ladies are into classics, too. Sure, but we're not talking about faculty. We're talking about lay people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we... Oh, the layest of the lay. <laughs> like, so lay. So terribly lay. So lay. Like, my... I am totally here to acknowledge that my... I have a dilettante interest in classics, right? Um, oh, my God, that is the truest thing that's ever been said about you. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not I am not going to be showing off all of my knowledge about like testudo formation and stuff today. Of course that's the example that a dude like me would know by name. Sure, I believe those are words. <laughs> huh, um Well, it's it's a so it's a it's it's oh, it's boy. when the it's when the soldiers all put their shields in the air and interlock them such that they are covered like the shell of a tortoise. Okay. Mm -hmm. So of course, like what I, you know, I do have an interest in ancient civilization period. Mm -hmm. um, As I'm sure most people do. It's utterly fascinating to think about where we come from. And then, on top of that, there's an interest in ancient emp- in ancient empire um, and kind of wondering, like, why? Why does one society rise so far above all of the others around it? Is it purely purely geographic determinism? Is it something in the water? What, what is it? That's all really, really fascinating. But I think I can acknowledge right off the bat that the particularly male fascination with Rome in particular, of all the ancient civilizations, is in part part of a particular particularly male preoccupation with violence. Can I just back up two steps here and say that as you were explaining, like, of course, it's totally normal to be fascinated with all of these things and empire and blah, blah, blah. And it was just like shudders over my eyes. Just because it's normal doesn't mean it's universal. No, no, no. I understand that. I'm just saying that, like, we could not be a better pair of people to talk about this because I had... I I thought that too, honey. (laughs) I have absolutely zero intellectual curiosity. I just don't. Sure, fine. I don't care. I don't. (laughs) I'm not interested. I don't find it interesting. I I, I, I I can't I can't get it up for the Roman Empire. I don't know. (laughs) My interest in ancient civilization, period, I think has has been prompted by my increasingly negative reaction. Uh, to the technology that has intertwined itself in my life. And 
it's really fascinating to think like how did people do things without any of this without any of the things that go ding without the <laughs> phones or the computers the electricity or the um or the internal combustion engines like how much how much could you do without any of the things and the answer is wow like a lot and some things have like changed not very much at all cooking hasn't changed that much you do it over a fire it's basically the same thing and it's why I don't know who, I think you actually brought this to my my attention some years ago, but somebody wrote an article pointing out some years ago that when you look at very old photographs, like the first photographs from the 19th century, mm -hmm. the people look like they're from another planet. They do not look like us. They look like a different species. It's just mm -hmm. so radically different. But when there are dogs in the pictures, the dogs just look like dogs. <laughs> like it, it could just be like, oh, that's the dog from down the street. Yeah. You know, like it's like... The dogs don't change. It's kind of the same thing with the Slightly food. Slightly more streetwise they look, <laughs> but... <laughs> kind of the same thing with the food. Yeah. You know, like there's this, you know, amazing, uh, you know, Roman food market kind of food hall thing in the in the ruins of Herculaneum, uh, which was the other city that was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius. And you look at like these these stalls and it's like, yeah, yeah that's, that's what we use now, except instead of being made out of yeah, aluminum and stainless, it's made out of stone, yeah, you know? Like, oh yeah, look, that's Pont City Market. Yeah. But, like... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. Um, but other things are so unimaginably different. And mm. it's such a fun thing to think about. But I will admit that, that there's something more going on. Like, why, why Rome of all of the great ancient civilizations? Now, first of all, it's just cultural bias, right? For those of us in the West, they look this like is us. Western yeah. civilization. This is what we, this is part of where we come from. Greco-Roman civilization, um, and it's part of where our, the intellectual history of this, you know, mm. this part of the world comes from, and, and it's what we learned about in school, right? Even you know, mm. if, if, even if even if you are not a Westerner, but you attended school here anyways, mm -hmm. um, you still you still probably have a certain affinity toward Rome and Greece because that's what you learned about most in school, probably. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think the fascination with Rome in particular does have to do in part with a particularly male fascination with violence. Um, or not necessarily violence, but domination. Domination. Wow. Good way of thinking about it. Yes. <laughs> um, like I. Well, it's, I don't it's think, power and control. Sure. Power and control. Like I don't think of myself as a particularly violent person person at all certainly not for a dude but like but i get i get violent impulses all the time when i have arguments with people i think i i i, I you know <laughs> say that into a microphone louder <laughs> well, you think, well you're not, there's no such thing as a thought crime honey um, it's what there are, there's no good and bad feelings it's what we do with them right oh um, mr rogers but um yes like i you know even in arguments with loved ones i have violent impulses all the time sure. um but i where where I probably have more stereotypically male energy is in in a certain um, added desire to dominate, <laughs> which I think manifests in like what am I doing right now? Like talking into a microphone and demanding an audience of tens of thousands of people, mm -hmm. and 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 telling them what's what. Doing I mean have I mean the, the fucking gravitas that it takes to just volunteer yourself to make instructional content on the internet like w the gall where the hell did I get off doing that which is so funny to me because you as a person like off mic are very much like oh I wish no one would listen to me <laughs> yes I wish that I could like I enjoy making things you wish you could and I enjoy being paid for it the world. but I wish that this was all pretend and it actually wasn't going out into the world somehow yeah <laughs> it was just you and me that's right of course, I wish it was just you and me, baby. Oh, my God. <laughs> Please excuse me. I'm getting over something. Something. Getting over it might be too strong a word. Yeah, I'm working on it. But I think there's another thing having to do with violence. Mm -hmm. um, more indirectly that I think is maybe explains actually my personal fascination with like the Roman legions in particular and like the legions, you know, history pundits are going to be so upset with us, but I will specify, let's say the legions at like, you know, the rough peak of the empire first, mm -hmm. late first, early second century. 
uh, Common Era, um, the you know the post Marius Reform army, which by the way, pedants. I know that the Marian reforms aren't mm. actually real. That's just like a old fashioned way of looking at what happened about it. It actually wasn't <laughs> Marius, but anyways. Oh. We, 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 I just know the fucking guy that's like writing that comment right now. I think we need to let those guys write those comments uh-huh. and up those views and just move on from them. <laughs> Here's my fascination with that and what kind of, I think, historical combat in general. And I would be curious to know if other men, f- this resonates with them or, or people, other people. Um, in a way, a society like Rome that rested upon its 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 infantry really it's it's common foot soldier mm-hmm. it was a in a way a person a human being and a man specifically was kind of had this intrinsic value that he lacks in today's society like i feel like with increasing technologization and automation mm-hmm. automation of our society and our our systems of production there's a certain set of human being that is increasingly and incredibly, terribly, sadly useless in the new order. And so like in Roman and, times, if you just showed up, right. you were valuable because you were one of the many. If and you the were more a man had, who could hold yeah. a pike and hold the line, right. no education, no fucking skills, no nothing. If but you like, could put one foot in front of the other and right. hold the thing. You were You useful. had some value. Yeah. Now that might sound very odd to people who are aware of that. Uh, you know, there's there's an argument that says the su- the incredible success of Rome was due chiefly to their total indifference to human life, sure, and that to their willingness to bleed way mm. more than any of their their enemies. They were always willing to sacrifice more and more soldiers mm-hmm. um, than the next guy because they had so many. Because they had a lot, um, <clears throat> and they were you know they had they also had this amazing bureaucracy to raise them and train them and all that mm. kind of stuff. But anyways, the the point is that, so you could say that, oh, a man was not valuable in the legions in the second century, right? He was the most disposable thing in the world, but, and that's true, but there's a way in which a, a man's death is, makes him very valuable. And what I think kind of eats at a certain kind of, of man today in, in developed country society and particularly the united states i think there's a certain kind of man who is becoming more and more dangerous every day because he is not hated not wanted but ignored not needed, <laughs> not needed simply mm-hmm. irrelevant and the power the the, the 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 powerful people the rich people which i guess mm-hmm. is now us honey like we don't care about that guy enough to genocide him. So you are know? you saying that we that just, guy just is thinking about the Roman Empire? I think maybe, yeah. This is a place where a, a loser like me who like has nothing going on for him, okay, at least I could be valuable. Like I can I can hold a seal a shield in one hand and a and a a gladius in the other and stab with it, you know, and, and hold the line. I can do that. And I would be important. I would have a purpose. Uh, there would be a place for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of these dudes now who like have no place, they invent these crazy conspiracy theories all about how, um, you know, the government is, has, is trying to control their minds and, you know, COVID precautions were all about, it's a, you know, a social control experiment and blah, blah, blah. Like they invent that stuff or they latch onto it because it's to, to be hated and feared is much better than to be ignored. Hmm. And I think that's how a lot of people feel nowadays, and especially men who, in, a certain working class men who have trouble or are having particular trouble finding a place in the evolving economy of developed nations. Yeah, maybe whether they know it or not. Yeah. Um, I just find the whole, the whole what tr- TikTok trend meme, mm-hmm. whatever it is, fascinating because it really did work across. I mean, you're talking about a very specific kind of man, but it works across genres. Like, <laughs> yeah. I never participate in TikTok nonsense. I, I like, a, I watch TikTok, but I don't make them. But I asked you in particular because I knew you were, it was going to like scratch your itch or whatever. <laughs> um, I knew I was going to get an answer. Yeah. But it really, it, so the um, sort of the culture writer, Anne Helen Peterson, was was talking about this. And I follow her on Instagram and I subscribe to her 
um, newsletter, and she was sort of asking people to respond why they thought this seemed to hit so many different kinds of men. And I mean, it was across ages. It was across races. It was across cultures. It was, I mean, truly incredible. Um, and, f- and my response was that it is the perfect male crossover event. So like, <laughs> whatever, as a man or male identifying person, whatever kind of you're into, be it cooking or urban planning or, you know, culture or history or economics or whatever, there is a trickle down effect from the Roman Empire. And uh-huh. so it all just kind of coalesces into this like big male it of delight. <laughs> um, but I want to ask you, uh-huh. did you think about the Roman Empire today? Like, did it come up to you today? Well, that's probably a bad example well, because true. I've been preparing, preparing for this, this conversation. Podcast. <laughs> true, true, true. But, like, when is the last time you think you organically thought about the Roman Empire? A, a real, legitimate... Yeah. I, I think... I, I, I'm not sure I think about the Roman Empire every day. I think about ancient civilization all the time. Okay. Um, and, and specifically this, this way that, like... And this is incredibly romanticized because this is not how it... <laughs> this yeah. is not how many c- civilizations have functioned for any length of time, but... The idea of it, of, of walking into a, a slightly more open world, a world where um, a, a person who, as long as they could, you know, stand up, walk around, pick things up, put them down, dig, you know, could just find some ground that hasn't been claimed by someone and homestead there and grow your own food and hunt your own game and fish your own fish and not have to go into a system Mm -hmm. um a time when just things were a little bit more open um and free and that's a a romantic thing that i think about sometimes and it's not all i can think about is that there are no bathrooms i know no bathrooms (laughs) and no antibiotics and no toothbrushes and so really i'm fine i'm great with things i appreciate you know, civilizations like Rome for all of their great masterworks of art at such. And you can now invest in some masterworks of art with uh, <laughs> Masterworks, sponsor of this episode. Skip the wait list and invest in blue chip art for the very first time by signing up for Masterworks at uh, masterworks.art slash ragusia. Super rich people invest in fine art all the time, in part because the market has historically moved pretty independently of your typical stock and bond markets. It can be an excellent way of diversifying your portfolio. Problem is, the kind of fine art that people buy and sell for millions of dollars costs, you know, millions of dollars, like a piece. So that has really limited who can participate in the market. Masterworks is a company that studies the fine art market, zeroes in on paintings and such that they think are likely to appreciate. They securitize that painting with the Securities and Exchange Commission, and then you can buy shares. When Masterworks thinks they can sell the painting for a good price, they'll sell it and then you'll get share of the profit. There's uh, no such thing as a sure thing in this world or in investing and past performance is no guarantee of future success. But check out masterworks.art slash ragusia. See all the great exits that they've had. Quite a few double digit returns this year. Do your research and see if this is the right way to diversify your portfolio. Masterworks has invested in paintings by the likes of Picasso, Banksy, Andy Warhol. I myself have some shares in a painting by the British uh, optical art painter Bridget Riley. I mostly just think it's kind of fun to own part of a great painting, and it was super easy for me to do on their website. New offerings have historically sold out fast, but you can skip the wait list right now with my link, masterworks.art slash ragusia. Masterworks.art slash ragusia. Thank you, Masterworks. Anywho, here's something that has nothing to do with violence. Okay. That where I think about Rome and other ancient civilizations very frequently, and that is urban planning. Right. Yes. Um, which I've been fascinated with my entire, you know, really it's since I was a child. It's one of the earliest things I remember knowing about you when right. we first started dating. And for people, especially people outside the United States, you know, you might not know that like we have, well, we have so many beautiful cities in this country. I love, you know, this, we have a lot of very nice stuff here, but like leave the uh, urban center of most American cities and you're going to see anonymous sprawl as far as the eye can see 
in what is often a really, really soul-killing landscape that can only be uh, navigated with an incredibly expensive car for which you need incredibly expensive insurance and maintenance. And it's like a really kind of terrible life that we have consigned ourselves to in many ways. Honestly, if you want the best ever description of this to me is from that John Hodgman 50 States book where Anthony Bourdain wrote about New Jersey. Oh, yeah. And he talks about... That was a great book and a great essay. Yeah, yeah and how like the he's in traveling, being in hotels and looking out the windows and realizing how often he could be anywhere yeah. because it's all so big box and it ends with, I could be in New Jersey. Anyway, it's it's fantastic. As But I really think that so if you ever want a short flavor of what it's like to live in the US but not in the... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not in the major cities. I think that's a good description. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's how I noticed it as a child. I remember, I have a distinct memory of like, because my dad used to have to like go to conferences a lot around Pennsylvania and stuff. When he was he was president of the Pennsylvania Psychological Association for a while, and uh, so we went to like the conferences all the time, like Harrisburg and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. And I I just started to notice that as we were getting into these places, oh, that looks just like where we live. Like mm-hmm. that's. Oh, I thought that I thought that that Exxon and Unimart combo was like <laughs> y- unique. No, uh, no, you know? yeah. And it's really kind of soul killing. And then you look at the Romans who under who had this incredible respect for the power of a of a well designed, a well laid out, walkable, dense mm-hmm. city, and how they were so insistent about not letting their cities sprawl. I mean, it, it, it happened in several situations, in Rome most of all, mm-hmm. but they really went into the founding of new cities out in the provinces in Gaul and such with the intent of like, there's a certain maximum number of people who, who can really live in one place. Mm-hmm. And if you go beyond that, it just becomes a mess. And so when they had more people, they would not expand the city, they would build a new one. Mm-hmm. And and I I... And more than that, I just love the idea of a city that has an end, mm. you know, like uh, the ability to just like walk out mm. of the city and then be in the country. That's an experience we do not have almost anywhere in the yeah. United States. It doesn't happen. Um, they all just sort of petered out and then blurred into each other. Yeah, it's just this very, very c- gradual fade where the sprawl just gets slightly more sparse. And then you don't even notice when ev- eventually you're, oh, it's, oh, now I'm finally, I have cornfields on both sides, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I find that very claustrophobic and suffocating. I, that's something that really upsets me about the way that we live and makes me so envious of, of, um, are the other English speaking place where we could live, um, which is. <clears throat> well, if you want me to start a fight in your comments, here we go. Oh, no. <laughs> this is always why I preferred ultimately Boston to New York. Mm-hmm. Because with when you were when you're in New York, you're in the urban core, and then to get out of a feeling of city, oh dude, you have to drive f- for what feels like forever. Yeah. And even the closest you're going to get is Long Island, and that's not that you know, whatever. Whereas in Boston, you could theoretically drive for half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour, and you're in the forest. And I I always appreciated that. Not during peak traffic time. Right. But like, I always appreciated it was like, oh my God, I'm feeling claustrophobic. I have to get out of the city. Yeah. I could very quickly feel like I was not in a city. Oh, absolutely. And you cannot do that in New York. I I mean, I I didn't. And I love New York. I didn't love living in Boston, but I loved all the day trips that we would do out to the Berkshires or up to New Hampshire Mm -hmm. or like, or like the overnights we would do up to Montreal and drive through, um, drive through Quebec. Oh my God. Love that stuff. That was wonderful. Mm. So I like, I mean, and that's all made possible by the automobile lifestyle, which like we do that for a reason. Like it has advantages and maybe all things considered, I do prefer it to the alternative. But the idea of going to a place like the UK where when they, you know, when we were building intercity highway systems, you know, in the United States, we thought, okay, should, should the highways go through the cities or around them. Let's put them through the cities. <laughs> right through the middle. Right through the, uh, the poorest, poorest black neighborhood that we yeah. can find. Yeah, we'll exactly. raise them to the ground and put 
47 lanes of concrete. Exactly. That's right. Um, and they yell at poor people when they have to sleep under them. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the UK, they mostly said, no, the motorways are going to mm-hmm. go around the cities. And they created, and then that, you know, that's, that's part and parcel of this whole kind of green belt initiative that they have to like create, mm-hmm. you know, as the sk- cities grow and they, sp- you know, tend to blur into each other, you create these green belts, these borders where you can go to the edge of town step off and be like a fish in open water and that's the kind of feeling that i i i I want from an ancient way of life Mm -hmm. that of a fish in open water that you can step out of civilization Mm -hmm. go into the wild the open a place that doesn't belong to anyone and be free be at risk but be free i think that's why people move to montana (laughs) <laughs> I, well, yeah, I mean, I guess what you do is you, you know, you buy a ranch. Or Alaska. And, you know, yeah. But it's cold. <laughs> and you have to fly everywhere there. I know, and which, like, means that you have, like, a one in ten chance of dying in a private plane crash if yeah. you are a member of Congress from Alaska, RIP, or a member of their family. Um, huh. Why do you, like, so, like, ladies who are into to classics, what would you... If you had to get inside their heads. No idea. No clue? None. I can't fathom what... I mean, look, I don't want to yuck anyone's yum. I just... I I find ancient history to be interesting because it's interesting, but I don't care to spend any time thinking about it. Right. I have other interests. So I've read like several pieces about women in classics in the last mm-hmm. few days to sort of think about this. Okay. And, and one of the arguments that I've seen made by several female scholars in, in classics is that um, the entry of, of women into th- those particularly male hist- dominated departments historically is um, has coincided with a rise in scholarship that they would call like kind of bottom up scholarship where you're looking at real people <laughs> um, uh, instead of instead of like caesar and his cronies right right and and that women have really taken the lead on mm-hmm. trying to put the focus on real people and hmm. what their lives <laughs> were actually like yeah and that sounds plausible to me like i i yeah. believe that yeah um i think that when you're a person in a group that who's not often the focus, it leads you to pay attention more to groups that aren't often the focus. I mean, I just in my own life, you know, as a woman who sometimes feels like my daily experiences are not part of, you know, what is considered the mainstream, um, you know, especially as a mother, I feel that society often, you know, forgets what the day-to-day experience of a mother is like and it forces me to not only notice my own experiences but the experiences of others that are overlooked right and that's why like it's not just you know woke whatever to (laughs) say that diversity in hiring for example is a good thing like there's all kinds of literature from uh you know business schools and such where they they show that (laughs) Uh, teams consisting of people from a, a bunch of diverse cultural perspectives tend to make better decisions. Yeah. Um, because they have... Well, you just have a, more ideas. Right, yeah. Because people are coming from different backgrounds. And I don't understand why that would be up for debate, but... <laughs> Indeed. The world is vast. <laughs> but if you are looking to hire someone who can represent some different perspective at your workplace or whatever mm-hmm. skill or point of view that you are looking for, consider finding them with Indeed, sponsor of this episode. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. You don't want to be spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates who have the right skills. You just want to use Indeed's powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all in one place. They streamline hiring with a bunch of powerful tools that help you find perfectly matched candidates. They have a system called Instant Match, 
Over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment that they sponsor a job on Indeed. And that's according to Indeed's U.S. data. And so many people are on Indeed. They've got all this research indicating that really the majority of job seekers are there. Look, online job seekers in the United States are looking for jobs on Indeed. It's where you want to be. It's where you can do virtual interviews with people. It's where you can do assessments, You know, give them skills assessments to take all in one place at Indeed. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Ragusea. That offer is good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit right now at Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. So, Mm -hmm. what should we talk about now? Um. <laughs> well, I think maybe what we need to say is like we need. To, I don't think we can talk about sort of a not just general fascination with Rome, but the particularly male fascination with Rome without acknowledging the kind of um, fascistic side of that. That um, Rome was uh, <laughs> not an egalitarian society. No, um, and that. A, I think a lot of what appeals to dudes about their idea of Rome, which isn't really Rome, it's like Hollywood's version of Rome, is like they see the statues with the chiseled abs and they think like, oh, these were the real ubermensch. Mm-hmm. These, this was the master race. And, and look at how well the world functions functioned back when a master race was allowed to rule over lesser peoples so, and they naturally in their mind assume that if we were to go back to such a system yes. then that they would be part there's, of the master race a which is a which is a big big leap to make there's guy. a lot of self-insert fanfic happening when it comes to the roman empire yes and men i think a lot of men thinking that they would be the one leading the army or the one you know th- the camera focuses on as they're like ah and triumph or whatever But I also, so this whole trend happened over the course, it like blew in and out in like a course of the week. And there was instantly this sort of moral panic about like, it's the Joe Roganification of men. And all these men are thinking about the Roman Empire because they're being influenced by these these male podcasts. Um, (laughs) And, you know, it's, it's it's, it's a secret right wing, blah, blah, blah. Which I think, frankly, like I said, I think that's, I'm sure there's a segment of it that is that, but I also, like I said, I think it is one of those perfect male crossover event things. And I think that felt very like liberals trying to Mm. poo poo men or like point fingers at the right wing. It's, 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 it's a moral well, actually, which is something that we on the left are pretty, (laughs) I mean, I would say it, was, it felt like a classic moral panic of like, oh my God, we all have to be worried about the fact that these men are constantly thinking about the Roman Empire because they're really being, you know, led astray by the alt-right, which yeah. I don't think was the case at all. I think that there is, it, there. I think it's more interesting to look at why men have room to think about the Roman Empire <laughs> and maybe women don't. Because then the flip side of the trend was, well, what is women's Roman Empire? Yeah. And there were a lot, you know, Taylor Swift or that uh, uh, the lip sync battle of a Rihanna's umbrella, that uh-huh. video. What's that little kid's name? Who was Spider-Man? Tom Holland. Tom Aww. Holland doing umbrella. Um, you know, and all of that. But the one that I found to be most true was this woman who was like, uh, how to not get kidnapped and murdered. And I was like, yeah, I mean, basically, if I think about what most commonly enters my brain on the average day, it is my personal safety. And like, am I, should I be walking down that road? Should I go out at night? Did I lock the door? Did I lock that door? Should I go out this way? Should I park there? Or is it safer to park there? Is that person following me? Did he look at me? Did I put something on the internet that might lead someone to be able to find me? You know, all, like, I feel like I am constantly, you know, It's like in those movies where people put on the goggles and all of a sudden they can like Google Glass see everything and it is just constantly evaluating safety. And I wonder if if men had to do that if they would spend so much time thinking about the fucking Roman Empire. (laughs) Well, if I could yes and that. (laughs) Okay. (coughs) Yes, of course, let's stipulate that like 
There's nothing inherently fascistic or wrong with being into Western Civ sure. and liking columns and arches. Okay, there's mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, there you know there is you know neo fascistic elements in 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 Western civilization are particularly fascinated mm-hmm. with Rome um, and. You know, the, and the, the the Nazis. That's that's what they were all about. You know, sure. Um, that was their whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just but, love but, the notion that men thinking about Roman the, the Roman Empire and doing self insert fanfic about it think that they wouldn't be one of the people on the bottom. Right. Exactly. Like, yeah. You come know, on, man. Yes. The the plura, You know, <laughs> it, you know, at city of Rome and year you know one hundred mm-hmm. CE would have been like thirty percent slaves mm-hmm. and you know. Mm-hmm. Five percent rich people and their families, mm-hmm. and then a whole bunch of you know dirt poor laborers and few you know kind of a, a little bit of a merchant class in there, and then that's it. Yeah. You know, like you you yeah you you wouldn't have been you probably would have been like carrying the trenching tools behind the legion, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, anyways, what I think. A lot of those dudes would say if they were here, and, and indeed an argument that is often made by kind of um, who, the, who I would call kind of the, the, the male revanchists, you know, the people who want to, the dudes who want to reclaim uh, the patriarchy, essentially. Sure. Um, and uh, what they would say is that there's nothing inherently wrong with the uniquely male preoccupation with violence because there's nothing inherently wrong with violence. Yes, violence can be used to attack and to harm and to destroy, but violence can also be used to protect and to defend. And we should seek to um, bring those those impulses out in men and not for- force them to, you know, Swallow them and sit at a desk job and pretend that they don't want to break things when they do. So are you trying so, to bring this back around to no, no, the no, fact no, that no, no, that I could let like not me personally, mm-hmm. but women could let go of their fast of their constant undercurrent of self preservation if we would just give over the protection. Absolutely to men? not. No, no, no. I'm gonna. Oh, dude, I'm gonna. <laughs> I I am gonna land this. I'm gonna land this seaplane. Okay, on some little f- fjord in Alaska. Okay, so smooth. Okay, lay it on me. All right. Um, so here's my counter argument to that. Okay. Okay. And this is this is I will stipulate. I will say you know as an, as a quick um, disclaimer. I fully embrace um, men, all people, but sort of men in particular, um, uh, putting their physical aggression into fitness and mm-hmm. manual labor. And there's things you can do with your bodies mm-hmm. um, to really channel that energy into something positive. But anyways. Um, put that aside. Uh, the reason why I think that that argument that we should, in, you know, encourage violent impulses in men so that they will be defenders, which is the argument that you hear a lot these days, maybe not put as so bluntly, uh, but that's the quiet part um, mm-hmm. that they sometimes say out loud, you know. So my counter argument to that is uh, it's I think this is an Internet meme I, I'm stealing from someone, uh, but uh, protect women and other people from whom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Protect it's like it's not we don't need to protect we don't need to protect our women and children from lions and tigers anymore, guys. Like mm-hmm. we've got we've got that pretty well taken care of. Well, I mean, if you really want to say the super quiet part out loud, the men who would be making that argument would be white and they would be making the argument of protecting their women from what kind of men? Well, sure. That's so. That's that old chestnut is always around. Yes. Yeah. Um, though, of also, course, though, of course, that kind of chauvinism is not unique to the white community. Sure. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. I, yeah, I, and it's, I just. So if men could stop being so fucking violent, women could think about the Roman Empire. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's the point I'm making. Yes. I, I might believe that. I think I might believe that. <laughs> you know? We're, we're at such a crossroads, us gentlemen. Um, you know, we are at a, at a, in, a, in crisis, um, in, both in many senses of the word crisis, um, but most of all in the sense of it just being a turning point, mm-hmm. um, a place where we have to, like, change and adapt. And a lot of the ways that we have 
historically related to the people in the world around us um, and a lot of the skills and desires and impulses that we've cultivated in ourselves and that and that and that by that biological evolution have cultivated within us a lot of those things are not really called for as much anymore in this new and better world that we ourselves have built for ourselves for a reason because it's better Mm -hmm. um but we have to adjust and i hope that you know i we were just talking about how i i kind of i hate having I hate being famous <laughs> and in the, in the, to the extent that I'm famous, I hate all of that. But you were just telling me like, what's the good part of my fame? Well, that I feel like you're positively influencing people, you know, the, the, if 80, nothing else, the 85% male audience yeah. that I have, you know, we were joking about how, when you go out, the people that most often come, come up to you, you to can say, spot Are a Madden Adam Brucia Adam? fan a mile yeah, away. Yeah, there, I'm, and they're kind all, of a nerdy boy with a sort of a peach fuzz they're so, mustache. They're always very what? sweet. And all I can think of is like that. I think it's great that those guys are sitting around with each other, watching your videos and learning to make a fucking steak. I think that is a great way to spend their time. And then maybe, I, you know, a lot of them will say like, I made your thing for my mom or I made your thing for my girlfriend or my boyfriend or whoever. And I just think like... What a delightful legacy to leave that you're teaching people to do to do things that they then use to show love to other people. I think that and like, yeah, there's all the other shit that comes with being on the Internet and all the arguments about whether or not you're doing it right or if you said the wrong thing. But like if you sweep all that shit aside, what you have is a really nice version of masculinity. And, you know, it, it, it's a worse mark to leave on the world. <laughs> It could be worse, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I appreciate that, honey. That's a very, very kind thing for you to say. And I feel like I should say something self-effacing right no, now. No, no. Um, sit sit in the sincerity. That's what we're working on, is you sitting in the sincerity. I don't want to sit in the sincerity. <laughs> yeah. I, we, ha- we, us dudes, we have to find ways to, if we want to, if we feel the call... Um, indulge our our deeply encoded dudedness in ways that are productive or at least not harmful. And I think like sitting around and studying like troop movements and formations and thinking about, well, if I was doing formation fighting, like, you know, would I would I be able to handle the pressure in the vanguard? Well, oh, you know, the cool thing about the Romans is that they only had to be in the vanguard for six minutes, and then mm-hmm. they would rotate back to the back line, and they get to wait and recharge both their physical uh, stamina and their courage. And so anyway, like, like it's it's perfectly fine to like mm-hmm. you know put put that energy into thinking about that because through that you can then start learning about like oh, why was Roman urban planning? better in a lot of ways than the urban than you know 21st century united states urban planning what can we learn about that wow um people with absolutely no technology or you know knowledge of chemistry or anything were able to like make mortared brick wow i've always been interested in like masonry i always wished i'd gone to trade school so i could lay brick i always watch those tiktoks of those like (laughs) beefy manly men in 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 like work clothes you know, laying brick and it looks so fucking satisfying. Well, dude, like make some Roman concrete in your backyard and build a pizza oven. That is my next project. <laughs> it's literally what I'm going to do. I'm so excited. Good. And that's fine. That's and when you feel the Roman Empire like to good use. you want to hurt something, um, smash some you know, go smash the weights. Okay. Um, you feel like you want to dominate something like dominate that fucking casserole man like you show that casserole who's boss you put in whatever the fuck you want you in there season man the shit out you of season it. the shit out of it you know um, and then you take it to somebody who you think genuinely needs their day brightened by a casserole yeah you know honestly or eat the shit out of it and make yourself feel better what has made me feel like a powerful fucking man like lately okay and it's it's so it's just i love it right it's like uh-huh. and it's um it's uh, extremely generous tipping. Oh, yeah. Right. Which I've gotten in the habit of doing ever since. COVID. You know, uh, COVID, but also well, this. that coincided with us having a lot yeah. more money, thanks thanks to the listeners and the viewers. Um, 
I so yeah, I like I just I just baseline tip at least fifty percent every oh yeah <laughs> every time every you know? every single place um, we go and I you know I got to do I got to do this like thing where it was uh one of those like mall cookie stores yeah. in the mall and like there was this guy who was you know this kid working at the counter of this mall cookie store mm. and there was a special needs adult ahead of me in the line who was like taking a long time and kind of yapping the year off of yeah. the young man behind the counter. And the young man behind the counter was so game and so sweet mm. and like was doing it. And you could tell that he was trying to kind of move it along because I was next in line mm. and, and, you know, and I was, just, he handled it masterfully, this mm. kid. And I was not, you know, impatient at all. And I got up there, you know, I just paid for my cookies and then I just put on a hundred dollar tip, you know, and mm. like walked away. And that felt, in addition to just like being felt more as you know as morally good as it was, substantively yeah. was right. God, I felt so fucking baller. Yeah, like I felt like I was an action figure walking away from a thing that's exploding behind <laughs> me. You know, because I just fucking yeah. you know did the hundred hit submit and walked away with that behind me, and it was yeah. oh, it was so fucking great, man. Like so. Be a good tipper. Be do like that's that's a power move. Yeah. That's a total big dog thing. Can I just say But it's good. I do not understand how there are celebrities in this world who are going out and patronizing any place. And if you're not tipping like this, what are you doing with your life? Lauren uh, for the listeners oh, was the doing the make it rain, rain international <laughs> symbol for making it rain. Yes. Cuz like <clears throat> Yeah, we tip 50% on every single thing minimum and then sometimes more right. if especially if it seems like the servers are real busy or yeah. having a hard time. I've gotten in the habit of just like going to the bank and just getting 20s and just and, like as I just I'm like Santa with fucking 20s yeah. just like I you know take the kids to mini golf 20 goes in the little cup and then you know they're also like <laughs> g- the give end. me the really nice you know ball the next time right when we're it's, trading in the tickets for all the prizes all the prizes they're like they're yeah like, you can have an extra piece of candy for the kids yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you right, don't have enough tickets right. for the sword it's okay they're gonna need the second sword if they're gonna sword fight right so just take the second sword right like it's it's fucking <laughs> awesome like so if you want to dominate some shit like Throw some go to around. school, go to school, learn to do something really useful, make a shit ton of money <laughs> and then give it away. So it's a long game, but it's yeah. a long game. But let me tell you, it's a good one. <laughs> it feels real good on a lot of levels. One of them, the uniquely male impulse to. Well, let's call it a fatherly instinct. What? A, a paternal instinct to a caring to care oh, for others. Oh, I see. It's I an see. instinct to care for others Got in it. its best side and its worst side. It's paternalism, right? Got it. Um, I see where you're going yeah. with that. Okay. Well, thanks for talking about this with me, honey. Sure. Thanks thank, for, ge- thanks for uh, answering the question the first time. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That I pointed my phone at you. Right. Was that on TikTok? Is that an actual thing on it TikTok? It is. It is on TikTok. That's on your TikTok. Lauren writes sometimes. That's my TikTok. Oh, sure. Hey, plug your book. Oh, yeah, I have a book. It's called Sister of the Bride. It's out. We made a video. It's cool. Come on, tell people a little about it. They might have not seen it. Okay, it's an adult romance. It's an adult romantic comedy. It's a retelling of the movie Father of the Bride, um, as, but as a funny, sexy romance full of... Spicy. Dad jokes and lasagna. Mm. Yeah. It's it's doing quite well. I'm, in, I'm happy. People, Fantastic. People seem to be liking it. And where can they find it? Um, you can buy the paperback wherever books are sold as an ebook. It's available exclusively on Amazon and free in Kindle Unlimited if you're a Kindle Unlimited subscriber. Lauren Morrill, novelist, thank you for joining us. <laughs> thank you for having me. And you make good choices, and I'll talk to you next time.